Joining us right now via Zoom chat is Dr. Michael Foley, a professor of patristics in uh, the great state of Texas, at Baylor University, praise be to God. But uh, we're glad to have him here because he's also the author of a series of books called Drinking with the Saints. Good morning to you, Dr. Foley. Good morning, Joe. Praise be to God. We're glad for your time today. Um, Drinking with the Saints, very interesting title. It gets a lot of people's attentions. And I have to imagine as a professor at a Baptist university, probably raises an eyebrow or two. Oh, absolutely. Um, I often get asked, how was I able to write Drinking with the Saints and uh, its two sequels on a dry campus? And uh, I have one answer, tenure. <laughs> That's a good, a good response for sure. Let's talk about uh, feasting and fasting. Catholics, uh, we are great at fasting. Well, okay. The church is great at fasting. Individual Catholics vary. Uh, performance varies, I would argue. But we just spend six weeks fasting. We have a mini Lent every Advent. We have Amber Days throughout the year where we, we do uh, penances. First Saturday is focused on reparation and penances and so many other devotions that are um, related to that and such a great patrimony and history in 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 fasting, but let's talk about feasting. What does it mean for Catholics to feast? Well, part of it does mean fasting, that you don't appreciate a feast until you have fasted beforehand. And that is why Easter is such a great feast, because we've had a long preparation for it. But uh, feasting is a form of gratitude to God. It, uh, it thanks God for the goodness of the, the goods that he's given us. It uh, both the temporal goods and the eternal. And um, it involves, um, part of that gratitude involves moderation. Um, you don't want to overdo it. But uh, but Catholics do have a reputation for making merry. And uh, you can understand their excitement and their giddiness uh, over uh, the goodness of the things they've been given. And the effort to to feast as well. I mean, I think of my own wife and all the effort she put in to prepare for Easter Sunday morning for our house, our family, our kids, and, you know, the, the meals, the, the little treats, the little details that she put into it. And I think about uh, our, our Lord, even, at the wedding feast of Cana, six stone water jars. I mean, I've, I've heard various accounts, but about 120 gallons of the choicest wine. I mean, maybe there was a thousand people there, and so that was spread responsibly. Or maybe, or maybe it was a lot for a very little people. Uh, how, how, how do we find the balance there? Uh, well, you, that's one of the reasons for fasting is that it sort of reboots, recalibrates, enables you to discard bad habits so that when the, the feasting moments come, you're, you're sort of better equipped to handle things with uh, prudence and moderation. Yeah. You know, Dr. Foley, I was thinking about this uh, drinking with the saints idea, and I was reading the life of St. Dominic over Lent, and, you know, one of the things was he refused to drink wine. He was like, you know, I, this is, it's, wine is delicious, it's good, so I'm going to avoid it. And he was ordered by his superior to drink wine, that he said, you need it because it's good for the health, it's good for merriment, uh, so you need to drink it. So he, out of obedience, he would have wine with his meals. Uh, could you talk a little bit about the history of the church in regards to uh, drinking? Because, you know, sometimes you see the saints where swear off all things, and the other times you see the monks who have, uh, who kind of invent <laughs> modern uh, brewing and also whis whiskey distilling and, and brings wine across the, the, the different, all over the globe because of the Holy Communion. Uh, could you talk a little bit about that? Sure. There actually have been several religious orders that uh, were completely dry, that alcohol was prohibited, just like there were a couple of vegetarian uh, religious orders. The funny thing is, none of them lasted. They only lasted a couple of generations. Instead, the, the orders that lasted were the Benedictines, the Dominicans, and not only did they have alcohol, but uh, at least for the Benedictines, uh, the monks were guaranteed a daily ration of alcohol. So uh, yes, there is a long history of Catholicism and alcohol. It's not related to drunkenness. In some respects, it's not even related to recreational drinking. Uh, it was, as you mentioned, related to health. Um, 
especially in an age where uh, safe water, uh, clean water was not a given. Um, having just a small amount of wine, you could pour it into your water and it would kill waterborne pathogens. So uh, for all kinds of health reasons, um, wine was considered very safe. So was beer. Uh, people would drink a kind of low alcohol beer in times of plague instead of the water supply and the beer drinkers would live while the water drinkers would die. So uh, yeah, there are a lot of reasons for this connection. I, similarly, I've heard uh, lots of uh, uh, people talk about how even in the first century in Palestine, they would have drinking more wine than water because the water was just very dirty, whereas uh, the wine was just more palatable. And, and I think the problem is we compare it to our time in an age where we go to a we go to a grocery store and pick up a bottle or we go to a liquor store and get some some spirit or whatever and a liquor. And uh, we think that we think it's more related to the excess, you know, of of alcohol rather than the moderation of alcohol. And we can't seem to wrap our head around uh, past times and their use of it. I'm also thinking about uh, uh, I had, there's a book on the shelf over here called The Rebel Yell. And uh, General Jackson in uh, the Civil War, he was he was known for not drinking. He would rarely ever take a drink, and he was being sort of chided by his by his uh, colleagues in the uh, in the Confederacy about not drinking. And he said, "It's not because I don't love it." He goes, "I love it. I love I love whiskey. It's good stuff." But that's why I won't drink it because I know I can't handle it. And let's talk about that for a second. Um, let's talk about the the. The intent and moderation. I, I, if I had a bowl of peanut M and M's in front of me, Doctor Foley, uh, chocolate covered peanut M and M's, I would go into a sugar coma for a month, and I couldn't help myself. I'd have no discipline. I would crush the entire bowl. I couldn't just have two. I'd have to have two billion. Um, why is that so hard for us? Well, you know, everyone has their own weakness, and that's what makes it dangerous. Um, one of the key things to moderation is knowing yourself and knowing your limits and knowing what your weaknesses are. And it varies uh, from person to person. Some people do have a weakness to abusing the bottle more than others. And it could come at different stages of your life. It can be stress-related. Uh, there are some theories that um, certain races are more prone to alcoholism. Uh, you know, Native Americans have the highest alcoholism rate in the world, mm. um, but there's but but we're not sure. And uh, culture is a huge influence as well. Uh, the world's group with the lowest alcoholism rate is Orthodox Jews. Really, only point <laughs> Orthodox Jews only point two percent. Oh wow! Of the population is alcoholic, and. The reason for that is because wine is on the table every night. And so uh, an Orthodox Jew grows up and never thinks of wine as something to be abused. He never thinks of it as um, a form of teenage rebellion or a forbidden fruit, the way a lot of American kids growing up today do. Um, and because it's just natural, he never abuses it. I want to ask you to get you to comment. You know, today, April 19th, 1775, the shot heard around the world. You know, the, the great thorn in the side of the, uh, the English kingdom and the American colonies was Massachusetts, not so much Virginia or some of these others, as much as Massachusetts, you know, the, it was the troublemaker, a Puritan colony. And it seems to me Puritanism is sort of an overreaction to some of the Catholic feasting out of the Protestant Reformation. What would you say to that? Oh, absolutely. Although, I mean, they they partied as well, and they were actually beer drinkers, um, unlike some you know some of their descendants today. But um, what they reacted to was the idea of combining the sacred with feasting. They had a really strong allergy to holy days. They banned Christmas both when they were living in England and in the United States. And when Catholics came to Massachusetts, they found devious ways of preventing us from celebrating Mass on Christmas Day or going to Mass on Christmas Day. They had uh, public schools had a mandatory requirement that you attended school on Christmas Day. 
And if you didn't, you'd get suspended. So uh, they were very anti-holiday or holy day, I should say. You know, Dr. Foley, I was thinking uh, but before the break, you were uh, answering a, a question, and I wanted to go back to that. The You were saying, because uh, I was thinking of the fact that so many Catholics, or just people in general, who have had a history of, like, when they're in their former lives or before their conversion, uh, they abused alcohol, and uh, then they kind of had a conversion to the faith, and then now they're uh, trying to live a good faith. They struggle with trying to understand how alcohol can be a good thing. And the same thing for people who grew up in households where alcohol was abused, or they had parents who abused alcohol, and then now they're like, oh, okay, well, I, we should just swear off alcohol, and alcohol is the boogeyman, and it becomes this huge thing. Uh, could you comment on that and how to overcome these little, these kind of uh, tendencies? Yeah, uh, excellent question. Well, if you come from a house where perhaps your parents abused alcohol, the chances are, well, I don't know what the statistics are, but I can just say from the people that I've met, they tend to be very responsible drinkers, um, almost you know, overly cautious because of the, the bad memories that they have. Um, as for recovering from a period of, of abusing the bottle yourself, I mean, again, it really varies. Uh, some people need to become uh, totally abstinent, uh, you know, enter AA, um, never, never touch the stuff again. Um, but others can find ways of drinking moderately. Sometimes for, uh, and again, it's just going to vary. I know people that will only drink beer because uh, hard liquor is just simply too much for them and it's too easy for them to abuse or they come up with other kinds of regimen, um, you know, uh, in order to sort of stay on top of it. But the good news is, I think you can stay on top of it. You just need to have a little more discipline and uh, awareness of your limitations. And what about instilling these ideals into your children? Uh, you were commenting about how in the Orthodox community, the Jewish Orthodox community, there is very low alcohol abuse. And uh, the in relation to that, could you comment on how to raise kids to not abuse alcohol, but to understand the proper place of it? Yes, you bring them up with five lessons, actually. The, the first is moderation. Um, the second is you teach them, and this is good for grown-ups as well, you teach them to drink with a sense of gratitude. Um, uh, because as Chesterton uh, it, so beautifully puts it, we should thank God for beer and burgundy by not drinking too much of them. <laughs> um, I also uh, teach my kids to drink with a sense of memory. Um, you, you don't want to drink to forget. You want to drink to remember. Unhealthy drinking is drinking to forget, but healthy drinking is drinking to remember. Um, you also want to drink with a sense of merriment that means fellowship, community. Uh, it's, it's, it's not immoral to drink alone, but uh, it's probably not a habit you want to develop. It's better to be drinking uh, in fellowship. And then finally, drink, especially around the dinner table, drink with a sense of ritual. Um, I think this is one of the reasons why the Puritans didn't like holy days, is that they were peppered with ritual. But ritual, for us Catholics, is part of a life of joy. It doesn't destroy joy, but it channels it. So a simple ritual for drinking is drinking with a toast. That's a very simple ritual, and it has a way of sort of crystallizing your, your drinking and your memory. I like what you're saying there, uh, Mr. Foley. Uh, that's, that's, that's really a helpful advice for people um, who are, you know, wondering how, well, how do we uh, talk about drinking? How do we, you know, talk about things that are very popular in the culture with our, our children? And those are really great examples 
uh, to to help them um, understand that you know maybe not abuse the the alcohol uh, is what I'm trying to say. But you know I'm, I'm sure you you incorporate some of those things into your feasting. You know now now that we're in in Easter we're in the octave. Uh, how do you feast in your family? How do you how does your family feast at home? Well, we had quite the Easter celebration the other day. Um, we have for our, ma our major holidays, we, we like to have a lot of uh, stragglers over, people who don't have uh, places to go during the holidays. So we had about 15 people on Easter. And uh, yeah, we had, a, we had a great time. And my family and I love to observe the feast days of the liturgical year especially particular customs. So I invented drinking with the saints because there were not a lot of drinks to pair with the feast days of the church year. Uh, traditionally speaking, there are a lot of foods, uh, and that's why we have so many Catholic cookbooks, uh, which do a wonderful job giving you traditional folk ideas. Mm -hmm. And uh, my family likes to follow those as well. So sort of drawing from the tradition, taking a break, during an important feast day, uh, it it punctuates the year. It animates the year. Uh, it well, frankly, it makes the year less boring um, hmm. to follow that liturgical rhythm. And I think it's important as well for families. It's uh, you know I've, we've gone traditional over the past uh, you know many years. We've grown more and more traditional, and now we we attend the uh, FSSP parish in our in our area. But as I've gone traditional, and that's been a bit of a struggle in some ways, and in other ways it's been beautiful and easy, but it's been hard to wrap my head around what is, does it mean to be a traditional Catholic? You know, and, and I've always uh, come to this conclusion, it's more than just the, the liturgy. It's more than just attending a more traditional uh, liturgy. It's living the, the actual life and breath of the church throughout your life, throughout every day, of every year in your home, outside of your home, it's everywhere. And I think this is part of it. And I think the issue I think I struggle with, Dr. Foley, is I am so far removed from the cultural background of my heritage being Scottish, um, and Scots these days practically are atheists anyway, that uh, that it's I can't wrap my head around it. But my wife, her parents are immigrants from from the Azores, from Portugal, and they live and breathe a culture that's native to them, that's uh, sort of uh, given in their language and their behavior and the things that they do that I can't wrap my head around. Do you think that there's an issue there with Americans in general? Like we're so far removed from these cultural identities that even as Catholics, it can be kind of a struggle to understand how to embrace these ideas? Oh, I think that's very true. And even at its best, the the danger of the American melting pot is that over time, those old customs melt away. It's not that there's anything necessarily wrong with uh, the American arrangement, but just uh, the, the power of erosion. Mm -hmm. uh, and you sort of lose some of those thick connections. Um, but the good news is, I really think you can rediscover and live tradition without having a particular cultural um, memory in, in order to do so. Uh, so like in your case, Joe, it's okay that, you know, you don't know what your Scottish Catholic ancestors from maybe 500 years ago were doing. Um, you can still pick up traditional customs you can be an American, and being an American does mean being a little eclectic, <laughs> and, uh, and and that's okay. That's just the love and the ruins kind of life we live these days, and, and I frankly am unashamed of the fact that I'll, if I hear a Portuguese custom that I like, I pick it up, and the next day it's a Ukrainian, and yeah. It actually, as as it reminds me of God. I do know what my uh, ancestors did 500 years ago. They kidnapped their rival, the McDonald, and threatened to kill him unless he gave them land. And guess what? They got the land. They got Duart Castle as a result to it. So that's a good Catholic a McLean clan from 500 years ago. <laughs> Praise be to God. We're, uh, we're running out of time here. Where can we get Drinking with the Saints? Drinking with the Saints and Drinking with St. Nick and Drinking with Your Patron Saints are all available on Amazon. 
Um, I also would like your viewers or listeners to know that uh, we are doing a river cruise, a pilgrimage through Fatima and Santiago de Compostela next summer. And you can find that information on uh, online on our website. Which is what? What's your website? Drinkingwiththesaints.com. Very good. Dr. Michael Foley, Professor of Patristics at Baylor University. Thank you for your time. So we're very grateful to you. God bless you. God love you. Thank you. All right. Check him out online, drinkingwiththesaints.com. Check out his uh, series of books as well. But that is going to do it for our number one of Catholic Drive Talk.